after 1945 and World War II is over, we created a myth about our involvement in World War II and everyone collectively misremembered what we actually contributed to World War II and used that myth in order to terrorize the entire world about how we are the best and how our democracy is perfect. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome or welcome back to the Madison channel. My name is Madison and today we have a special, it's always special, installment of True Crime in Society for Asian American and Pacific Islander, Islander Heritage Month. Today we're going to be discussing the nuclear bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. But before we get into that, um, if you know me, hello, thank you for coming back to the channel, thank you so much for supporting, it would mean everything if you could stop and interact with this video, like, comment, you know, do something like that, watch the ads, all of the things, and if you are new here, thank you so much for finding me, there's a mountain of content for you to catch up on, and if you don't mind pressing that subscribe button and that bell notification so you know when I post my next video. That being said, for both of y'all, if you don't follow me on TikTok or Instagram, both both of my um, usernames are down in the description box, so click those links, follow me there. I'm more active on TikTok. I go live all the time randomly about random things, um, so check me out there. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this episode, I just want to say a couple things. Now, my last video that I made um, was a um, interview that I feel really proud about, I'm really happy about, that I did with... Um, um, Kayla Barfield's older sister. Now, if you don't know the case of Kayla Barfield, it is a relatively new-ish case. It happened last year. Kayla Barfield was held hostage and um, eventually beaten to death by her kidnappers. Um, the police are doing absolutely nothing about solving this case. They really don't seem to want to solve this case, even though there is evidence that they could be linking to people. These people are still at large. They're still on the street. No one has been convicted. And I did a interview with her older sister who is desperately turning to social media in order to get traction around the justice for Kayla hashtag and get people to rally around her sister so they can get justice and get some of the answers um, answered. That being said, that's a video that I really, really want you guys to watch and interact with because the more it does, the more people know about Kayla Barfield's case, the more people can pressure the police department in D.C. to actually do something to solve that case. And in the pinned comment and the description of that video, you will see three different things that you can do in order to help get justice for Kayla. One of those things is donating to the Justice for Kayla GoFundMe, where... Um, Kayla's sister, Janine McDougal, is trying to raise money to hire a private investigator in order to get more information about what happened to Kayla, who these people were, and hopefully pressure the police into getting a conviction. Um, and the other two things are two numbers that you should call. They are the numbers of the lead detective as well as his lieutenant who are on the case who have been effectively ignoring Kayla Barfield's family and um, really not talking to them at, the, at all, lying about calling them back, all of that kind of r rigmarole. So if you could just do one of those three things or all three of those things, that would be wonderful. And if you haven't seen that video, go check it out. Um, go interact with it so it can do better in the algorithm. Mwah. So... <laughs> First and foremost, this is my very first video for Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This is a big topic and people have a lot of opinions. So I'm going to try and breeze through kind of the contextual stuff um, quickly and get to some of the things that make this to me a true crime case. Again, if you are new here, I have a original take I'd like to say on what true crime is in my opinion war crimes are true crime stories um, history is a true crime story and labeling something as a true crime story isn't trying to belittle anything or do anything different um, to me labeling these situations as true crime stories is centering the victims of these crimes instead of just telling it like we usually tell it like we dropped the bomb on Japan and won the war that's not 
how we're telling it. We're kind of widening the definition of true crime in order to have that be a part of it. There's a macro true crime, there's a micro true crime, and I balance between both on this channel. Now, um, talking about World War II as a black woman is complex. A black woman in America is complex for many, many reasons. First and foremost, World War II is my favorite war to kind of dystopian to say, but it's one of my... Um, my favorite times in history to review and reflect on. I, I chew on World War II so much. Um, it's been an obsession of mine since I was young, and I figured out what World War II was actually fought about. And um, But as a black woman, and I, as I've grown as a black woman, thinking about World War II is complicated because, for one, the United States government knew what was happening to the Jewish people um, from the early 30s through Hitler's, um, you know, the Nazis and everything in Germany. We did, we were kind of isolationists at the time and we didn't want to get involved with it. Um, what a lot of people won't tell you is the eugenics concepts were founded in America. Um, uh, Harrison, is it Harrison Ford? No, not Harrison Ford. That's the actor. Ford the the car guy he um Henry Ford anyway Ford the car guy he was big on eugenics he was gifted um a medal from Hitler himself like our connection to the dark side of World War II is much more close than us kind of trying to make this fable like we were always on the right side of history we were always the saviors in the case of World War II that's not how it was we were letting those Jew Jewish people get slaughtered we we were turning a blind eye in fact a lot of America at the time was very white supremacist they didn't care a lot of the same propaganda used against Jewish people is used here has been used here period so um, the way we like to pontificate about how we were he, we were the white knights at the darkest hour and we helped Europe and we helped everybody we freed everyone from the Nazis that's not exactly true because the Nazis got their ideas from us and got their ideas of how to treat Jewish people on how we treated Native Americans and slaves so you know it's complicated. Um, on top of that, too, you know, that's complicated because, you know, as an American, that's a big part of our history. The Great War, they call it, you know, the golden, the, the city on a hill, all of these things about what America is, the classic American, what you think of classic middle America, cherry pie, apple pie, uh, Fourth of July barbecues, all of that is based around the the high we were feeling after winning World War II, right? But a lot of that is based in how we shifted the story because a lot of history is written um, by the winners. So, um, you know, we use what happened in World War II, erase the fact that we really didn't care about the Jewish people. We only entered because of Pearl Harbor and then eventually continued on. But, um, you know... We like to erase that part that doesn't exactly fit the narrative and only continue on with the fact that we are American, we are democracy, we are saving Europe, we are uh, riding on a high, we're amazing, we're the best, rock, flag, and eagle, all of that stuff, which isn't true. Now, um, when it comes to the nuclear bomb, um, God, I mean... When you really research what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and you understand um, the the climate that Japan was in at the time, you understand the context for the war ending, the real context, um, the propaganda they try to throw your way about how it was absolutely necessary to drop those bombs on those innocent people, you really quickly find is complete bullshit. Um, it's something we tell ourselves to sleep well at night when in actuality when we drop those bombs when we dropped little man and fat boy on Hiroshima and Nagasaki respectively we single-handedly changed war forever we single-handedly hand changed geopolitics in on the planet forever and we single-handedly ushered in the arms race and the cold war simultaneously with those two actions and so 
it's not that it was necessary. And once you grasp that, you start to look at it from a different angle. You start to understand that these were innocent people. You start to see that America was trying to get the maximum amount of bloodshed while also trying to show its power as a superpower um, in order to kind of be able to bolster that into um imperialism and other forms of colonialism from that point forward and you just see that um so that's what we're going to be talking to talking to um talking about today and that's why i'm titling this or trying to tell it through the lens of a true crime story there are is a clear victim which are the people of nagasaki there are the people of hiroshima there are clear villains which is america the american industrial complex combined with the japanese government uh, if we're not <laughs> if we're being fucking for real but we'll get it all into that in this episode so let's do that okay so first and foremost we have to understand that history is written typically from the the standpoint of what we accomplish and not what we did to other people so instead of looking at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and dropping those nuclear bombs on those places as, um, you know, those innocent hundreds of thousands of people that were affected by this and still are by this, we don't talk about the story like that. We talk about it like Japan forced our hand to drop those nuclear weapons on those innocent civilians. Now, I want to take a pause here and make sure we're all understanding where we are historically right world war one threw everybody for a fucking loop okay it, it, it threw the entire world through a loop trench warfare shell shock all of that it, it made everyone insane um pretty much and um after world war one war tactics changed you know, there were certain times when, you know, people would bomb civilians and cities, but typically, you know, everything was kept on the battlefield, hence why it was trench warfare. You know, we met up somewhere, we had an interaction, and we were battling it out for that territory or gaining on that territory. Rarely were there cases where they would bomb a city for the hell of it, right? But the line started to get blurred a little bit during world war one world war two honey world war two is when that line was completely erased no longer was there a difference between civilian and soldier and battlefield and city it was all's fair in love and war we're gonna firebomb these this city we're gonna firebomb these innocent citizens we're going to bomb until the government it has so much bodies on their hands that they have to either surrender or or um you know you know basically give up and that was that turned that's what war turned into it turned into racking up that body count of your opponent so much and creating more and more devastation for innocent lives that the pressure to surrender from the people around you becomes deafening that civilian lives became war tactics instead of civilian lives and so when we're talking about where the mindset in wartime was when these two bombs were dropped that's where we were we had already bombed dresden you know not we had but you know the bombing of dresden had already happened they had already been firebombing the hell out of japan at this point and um killing hundreds of thousands of people completely decimating um whole cities whole whole areas of land um and that was used as a tactic it wasn't it was no longer about we are soldiers you are soldiers we are fighting here because we're soldiers it's about let's kill this innocent baby and see how the backlash from the government or the pressure from the people um on their government affects how they then continue on in the war are they going to surrender are they going to yield or do they want more kind of thing you know so that's where we are contextually with warfare during world war ii on top of that right there's this kind of like how do you explain it on top of that there's a racial aspect right there had been a steady since Pearl Harbor, well, since before Pearl Harbor, you know, yellow peril that was happening before, you know, 
um, World War II. So there's already anti-Asian sentiments in the United States, obviously. But um, specifically, after Pearl Harbor, there was a heightenedness to separate white people from Asian people and Americans from Asian people. So we had the internment camps, um, which people don't really talk about, but also there was a, a, a intense media push of propaganda through Disney, through all of the big Hollywood studios to make movies that propped up whiteness and made um, Asianness or, or or Jewishness or whatever seem as the other thing. They were closer to animals than humans. You were we are not even the same species. So that is where the mindset was as well. There's a racial aspect. So the thought of you deciding to kill a hundred thousand Americans, oh my God, I can't even imagine that. But you deciding to kill a hundred thousand Japanese people, those evil, sneaky, blah blah blah. Oh yeah exterminate them that was the vibe because we, it was a heightened thing they were already kind of on the same plot land as the nazis with you know getting all the japanese people taking their businesses putting them in camps you know making them work like we were already there at the same time as the nazis were doing that to the jewish people attention please this film now released for public showing has been captured from the enemy it is a typical example of vicious Japanese propaganda. So you have to combine all that together and understand that um, the mindset of the time was not to see these people as people and that civilians were fair game in love and war, period. Another thing that I find interesting, too, about the conversation about the nuclear bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima is that a lot of times people like to say that everybody was in agreement at the time that this was the one thing we had to do to end the war and they forced our hands and uh it was a terrible decision but we had to do it for the greater good of us all type thing right when in actuality there were a there was a lot of pushback by a lot of people even scientists who helped you know, create the nuclear bombs. There's a lot of pushback about actually using these bombs in warfare because of what it could mean and the and the complications that we're living through now, right? So this fake idea, this falseness of, oh, you know, we had to do this, everyone was in support. There are many governmental officials that spoke out publicly about the necessity to use nuclear warfare to kill this many people openly. They were widely criticized. They were widely talked about. But at the end of the day, it was something that people were having a conversation about actively. It was an active conversation about morality and ethics in war when it came to these bombs. So don't get it twisted. People were having that same conversation in 1945 that, you know, again, we're doing context here, context, big brain, context. We're thinking of the world that we're in at this point in time. Germans were a quite a large population in the United States during World War II. The Japanese were a very small, concentrated population of people, of immigrants, in the United States during World War II. And the different treatment, like why weren't Germans also taken into internment camps? Because we were at war with Ger Germany as well. Their country was going absolutely haywire. And... um you think about this and you start to understand that the language the language with which they were talking about the Japanese people versus the German people or not even really acknowledging that they have a connection to Germany right that we're at war with was full on white supremacy there are way more Germans in the United States at this particular time than they were Japanese people and yet the microscope was on the Japanese people because they looked different they had different traditions they weren't white you know but the real linchpin that I think is important to understand is we were lobbying a very intense firebombing campaign on Japan. 
um, and I'm going to insert a clip from the documentary that I'll be watching next week called um, The Fog of War. Um, so here it is. 50 square miles of Tokyo were burned. Tokyo was a wooden city, and when we dropped these firebombs, and it just burned it. The choice of incendiary bombs, where did that come from? I think the, the, the issue is not so much incendiary bombs. I think the issue is, in order to win a war, should you kill 100,000 people in one night by firebombing or any other way? LeMay's answer would be clearly yes. Magnamar, do you mean to say that instead of killing 100,000, burning to death 100,000 Japanese civilians in that one night, we should have burned to death a lesser number or none? And then had our soldiers cross the beaches in Tokyo and been slaughtered in the tens of thousands? Is that what you're proposing? Why was it necessary to drop the nuclear bomb if LeMay was burning up Japan? And he went on from, from Tokyo to firebomb other cities. 58% of Yokohama. Yokohama is roughly the size of Cleveland. 58% of Cleveland destroyed. Tokyo is roughly the size of New York. 51% of New York destroyed. 99% of the equivalent of Chattanooga, which was Toyama. 40% of the equivalent of Los Angeles, which was Nagoya. This was all done before the dropping of the nuclear bomb, which, by the way, was dropped by LeMay's command. Proportionality should be a guideline of war. Killing 50 to 90 percent of the people of 67 Japanese cities and then bombing them with two nuclear bombs is not proportional. It wasn't really necessary for us to drop those two nuclear bombs on Japan at that time because we had already killed hundreds of thousands of people and already destroyed great proportions of these major cities in Japan. It, it wasn't anything else but to show more destruction. And some people may say, oh, it was a magnitude. It was the fact that it, it, these bombs had never been used before and those power of these, you know, two singular bombs and stuff like that. Sure, but when you think about it and you really understand the context for which these bombs were dropped and what was going on behind the scenes, you start to understand that this was more of a wartime exercise and a show of force than a genuine want to stop the bloodshed, period. Now, on July 16th, 1945, um, the first successful bomb testing happened, nuclear bomb testing happened in New Mexico. And if you look back at Harry Truman's diary, he's delighted, but he makes a very direct statement in his diary saying that he, this will only be used in um, wartime on soldiers. This will never be used for women and children. Right. Um, and, you know, when I was doing my research, the, uh, one of the articles I read made a really good point about a president's diary versus what they really think, you know. A president knows they're always going to go down in history no matter what, period. You're going to be, you, you are the president of the United States. You are part of our American history. Your tenure is a part of our American history. That means that the stuff you own, the stuff you write, the words you speak will also be historical record. And you know that. So if Harry Truman is writing this in his diary, is it genuine or is it because he knows that eventually people are going to look back at this time, look back at wartime during this time, find his diary, see what he was thinking and th seeing what he was talking about? And was he just trying to enshrine his reputation? You know, these are just questions that I have. But anyway, the test is successful in New Mexico and Harry Truman, super excited, makes a statement. We're not using it on women and children. We never will. And um, at the same time, though, secretly, secretly, I'm just two hours after that very successful bomb testing. There is an ultra secret mission to get a bomb. On, get a nuclear bomb on a ship and ship it across the ocean to an island that was a short plane ride from mainland Japan. So this is already happening. 
things are already in motion right this is what i mean by the history the true history the true facts the true timeline so harry truman gets word that the the bomb test was successful in new mexico two hours later a nuclear bomb is making its way by ship to uh, to an island just off of mainland japan two hours later now this is a really interesting tidbit that i found out too but that was an obviously an ultra top secret mission right so all the men on that ship are not supposed to tell where they are what they're shipping where they're going we're just supposed to get that bomb to that island where we had a base um (laughs) on the way back to the united states so that same boat after they drop off the bomb the same boat got shot down by a japanese ship liner and um out of the 800 men on that boat 500 men didn't make it out alive because you know what people drowned various reasons but um they couldn't it was such a huge casualty because they couldn't call and say and call for backup and say you know we just got shut down here blah 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 because it would call into question the fact that they were taking the nuclear bomb to this island just off of mainland japan so they they had to just deal with what happened um the aftermath the destruction of the japanese soldiers shooting down their ship and the other thing that's interesting is you know obviously 500 out of the 800 people died um in that situation in the water as the aftermath of that but that guy who does um that one crazy monologue where he's like you know a shark's eyes are black like a doll's eyes so listen whatever i'll i'll insert it here you on the indianapolis what happened japanese submarine slammed two torpedoes into her side chief it was coming back from the island of tinian the lady just delivered the bomb the hiroshima bomb 1,100 men went into the water. The vessel went down in 12 minutes. Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. Tiger, 13-footer. You know you know that when you're in the water, Chief? You tell by looking from the dorsal to the tail. Well, we didn't know. But our bomb mission had been so secret. No distress signal had been sent. They didn't even list us overdue for a week. Very first light, Chief. Sharks come cruising. So we formed ourselves into tight groups. You know, it's kind of like old squares in a battle, like you see in a calendar, like the Battle of Waterloo, and the idea was, shark comes the nearest man, that man, he start pounding and hollering and screaming, and sometimes the shark would go away. Sometimes he wouldn't go away. Sometimes that shark, he looks right into you, right into your eyes. You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white and then, oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched scream. He was he was talking about him being on that mission where those people died. So that guy and him experiencing, you know, the shark attacks while they were just floating in the water, unable to call for backup. Um, You know, people drowned. There were shark attacks. That was something that was confirmed. But um, Steven Spielberg, he did Jaws, right? He was he took that, you know, historical fact and created that character around that. And the reason why he knew what to do with the shark and was so intense and brooding was because he had was a victim of that situation. So I don't know. It's just interesting references to nuclear bombs all over the place in all of our popular culture. Joe. The point is, um what harry truman saying in his diary versus his actions are two very different things if he really wasn't trying to like use this bomb and put it on ice and kind of you know have boundaries for when and where to use it why was it already being shipped after the first two hours after the first successful bomb test right 
crazy. So what was going on in Japan at this time, right? That's probably the main question because the way the United States says that Japan forced its hand to use those bombs, you'd have to think that Japan was just winning the war, they were killing it, and this was a desperate act in, in the fourth act in order to save humanity as we like to pontificate and teach people historically about these two bombs. The truth is Japan was really close to surrender in the summer of 1945. Like they were struggling in this war. They bit off more than they could chew with America joining in. They were really screwed. Um, They were running out of fuel. They were running out of supplies. It was really dire. And there were already talks of surrender in June of 1945. The only problem was the emperor wanted to be able to save face. So his thought was we need to do one big blowout fight and kill as many people as we possibly can and then we'll surrender in order to capitalize on the bloodshed for the americans and stuff like that um the talking about war and learning about war and how these generals and politicians talk about war and talk about these human lives as if they're just collateral as if they're just nothing really is kind of disturbing like even how harry truman was like oh yeah like um we're only going to use this bomb on soldiers, not women and children. And it's like, they're people too, question mark. Why do we have to use this bomb in the first place? But like I said, the villains of the story also involve the Japanese um, military and the Japanese government chow. If you, if, you want, if you know, you know, go back to my video, a couple of videos down on um, J- uh, Korean comfort woman and you know what I'm talking about. Japan was no saint, let me tell you that. But... Um, They were already on the brink of figuring out how to back out of this war, surrender, and save as much face as possible. And at that point in time, they wanted to do this big blowout battle. But what a lot of people don't know and don't think about, um, which is a really important fact that people like to brush over, is that... um, Japan was really, really, really concerned about the Soviet Union getting involved in wartime with them. Really concerned about it. One, because they knew if the Soviet Union won between the two of them, they could not have an emperor at all anymore because that's not that doesn't fly in communism. You know, you don't you don't have an emperor. There's no divine choosing of someone to lead there's no divine lineage you know that's not how that works they knew that they couldn't maintain their emperor um if the soviet union ended up winning but what they knew with the united states is there is a little wiggle room with us you know we would take your shit you know and take your money and put in a maybe we'll have the emperor but he'd be you know doing our bidding but you could still have the face of having an emperor you know there was a little wiggle room with us so the thought of the soviet union joining the war in japan was a very very stressful thought is a is a thought that they absolutely did not want to happen they dreaded the thought of it now when germany and when soviet the Soviet Union and Germany kind of ended, you know, Soviet Union, you know, yielded to Germany or whatever. Um, not the Soviet Union. The, the Germany yielded to the Soviet Union. Child, I'm rewriting history myself. Um, the Soviet Union was turning towards Japan because they wanted to. What people don't understand is when you win a war, you get things. You get money. You get land. You get influence. You get people to colonize. You get stuff. And so they were looking at Japan next because the Japanese war was still going on, right? So, um,. The Japanese were already thinking of surrender, but they were really concerned about the Soviet Union's involvement. And eventually the Soviet Union wants to get involved in the war with them. And many people who are critical of the use of the two nuclear bombs use this piece of information that's really important as kind of their thesis statement. The, the Japanese government was terrified of the Soviet Union getting involved, and it just so happens that they got involved um, right when we dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. And so it's hard to say, was it the A-bomb or was it the fact that the Soviet Union joined the war against Japan and they were forced into submission? Uh, We'll get more into that argument later. But um, 
yeah, the reality is the Japanese government wasn't really giving an a, a F about its civilians. Like, the civilians were important, and the casualties of the civilians in, during these firebombing campaigns were important, but in reality, the leadership of Japan at the time was really concerned with um, the emperor, the army, and their land and their money. The civilians were somewhere like 10th on the list. So when you really put it into perspective, if going back to that clip I just showed you about the firebomb campaigns and stuff like that, you start to realize that more people were killed in those firebombing campaigns than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined, specifically the ones in Tokyo. And the Japanese government didn't yield then. So much of the, Japan was burned during these firebomb campaigns. And so many people died. So gargantuan head and shoulder amounts above the people who died in the nuclear war and the nuclear bombs dropping. And Japan didn't yield to the casualties they didn't flinch at the casualties because the casualties of civilians are like 10,000th on the list of their priorities so when you think about that and then you think about their actual real fear of the Soviet Union getting involved in that war and you see the timing of the so the Soviet Union declaring war on Japan was the exact day the United States government dropped a bomb on Nagasaki and then a few days later Japan you know surrenders I don't think it's the bombs. I don't think it's the bombs. I think America wants us to think it's the bombs so that we can say we were important in ending both wars. But I think in actuality, the casualties um, of the bombing was obviously a lot, but it wasn't as much as the firebombing. So why would the Japanese government's feelings about civilians dying all of a sudden change, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? You know where I'm getting at. You know what I'm doing. Now, add into the mix the American desperation to do everything before and better than the Soviet Union during this time. Now, a lot of people may be confused because in World War II, we were on the same side. We were working together to fight, you know, the axes of evil and things like that. But very soon after World War II, the Soviet Union emerged as the close second to us in terms of winners of the actual war. Um, and instead of trying to make an allyship, because the Soviet Union was communist and the American leadership at the time thought communism was an infection, was a disease that would spread, it was a domino effect, it was the antithesis to capitalism and we in democracy and we needed to, to not have anything to do with it and eradicate it from the, our entire planet. The United States and the Soviet Union were starting to butt heads towards the end of this war. And so you add in that energy of wanting to be the best, wanting to be the biggest, wanting to be the baddest, wanting to be the most feared on top of that, which was characterizing American diplomacy at the time. Um, you understand why we would veer in the direction of a nuclear bomb, a bomb that's never been used before, um, a bomb with crazy mass destruction versus a more diplomatic route that may take a little bit more time, but allow the Soviet Union to kind of gain footing in Japan where we ha would have to share the surrender with the Soviet Union and not be the ones to facilitate the surrender of Japan ourselves. Does that make sense? I hope I'm making sense. Um, we wanted all the glory. We didn't want to share it, especially with communists. Did that make sense? Great. FDR, who was a Truman's predecessor, had a very kind of benign relationship with Stalin at the uh, before. You know, it wasn't really antagonistic. It wasn't really like poking and prodding and trying to like, ugh, like show the be gruff and show his chest or anything. But Truman was very antagonistic and that with, with Stalin, very aggressive. And that kind of led to a lot of morally questionable choices um, legislatively um, that came out of his cabinet because there was this need to address this red fear of communism. There was this need to establish himself as um, anti-communist in such an aggressive way. So again, we're, we're talking about the context. We're talking about the way in which these decisions were made. 
when it came to deciding to drop these bombs and you see how it, very little of these decision making the context is really about Japan and the war a lot of it is about how the United States wanted to posture and look after the war was over especially against the Soviet Union or um, the United States probably could have gone in in July and worked out some sort of diplomatic diplomatic surrender with the Japanese government um, because the Japanese government wanted to work out a diplomatic solution with the United States because they could potentially keep the emperor as a figurehead of, of the whole you know country um, so they could use that but because it wasn't as flashy as dropping those two bombs Truman didn't like that idea at all didn't want to pursue the diplomatic option at all before going to the to the nuclear bombs it wasn't like we had exhausted all options and japan was like no no we're not quitting that's not the case we wanted the bigger the flashier the bloodier the crazier option from the jump in order to be able to posture on top of that and show our strength which is why and, and we're going to kind of, you know, get back into the story a little bit in a second. But this is why this is a true crime story. This was premeditated. This was clearly um, targeted. This was clear with a clear goal of being sadistic and killing people like um, the American government, Harry Truman, of this point in time were serial killers. They chose that option because they because of the self-esteem of the country they chose nuclear war instead of diplomacy even though they probably could have gotten the same result with diplomacy they chose that and then lied about it to us in history to make it seem like the japanese government wouldn't hear it wouldn't talk about it and we were forced into being this violent no baby we could have talked we just never exhausted that option because of the evil, vile nature of the reputations that are made in wartime. And we wanted the reputation of being the biggest, the baddest, the strongest. So what did that mean? Using two bombs that had never been used before in on innocent civilians in order to meet get a means to an end. And so when I say, you know, look at this as a true crime story, look at this as a true crime story, doesn't that kind of remind you of a serial killer who visits the scene of the crime or speaks to the police officers to try and get notoriety on his name or is obsessed with how they're reporting on the case in order to, you know, um, get validation for the genius that they seem that they are because they're, you know, sick in the head. Um, it's not about the victims. It's about how we are going to look, you know, and that's why I'm choosing to tell it this way instead of saying, you know, what no, most people say. Uh, we needed to do it to end the war. No, we didn't. And I will give you another point as to why we did not When you hear people who are very uh, for the nuclear bombings of um, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, a lot of the argument is like, well, if we didn't bomb them, a trillion American soldiers would have been killed if we had to go onto the J Japanese homeland and fight a fist to cuff. Like, we, we would have lost a billion people. The reality of that is... And there's numbers, there's there's statis, statisticians that, that ran the numbers. And the truth is, not saying that these lives aren't valuable, not dehumanizing these soldiers at all, but saying that a trillion American soldier lives versus one third of 200,000, that's a different conversation. Still a lot. Yes, yes, yes. But where I get that number from is basically Truman had um, okayed um, to have 200 soldiers on standby to infiltrate Japan, right? And um, in in the hopes that they don't surrender, you know. And the statist statisticians at the time made a kind of um, liberal calculation that probably one third of those 200,000 200, soldiers would die. Still big casualties, still a lot of people not saying it's not. But what I am saying is, um, you know, <laughs> but what I am saying is at the end of the day, 
It's not a billion, it's not a trillion. And let these people who are so obsessed with the fact that we dropped those nuclear bombs on Japan um, and think it's the right decision, the best decision that could have ever been made, let them tell it and you're going to hear such exaggerated numbers that weren't even on the table in the first place. So another point where it's like you're using these arguments as to why you needed to drop this bomb but then when you look back at the facts of the time those arguments don't stand because that just wasn't true it just wasn't it just wasn't and then again i talk about this theme a lot in my youtube videos but this this um sacrificial like we had to kill them in order for the greater good the greater good the war ending all these american lives saved blah 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 but why is it that people of color, women, marginalized people in general always get the shorter end of the stick when it comes to the greater good conversation? The greater good conversation, the greatest good that they're trying to protect is whiteness. Ciao. Anyway. Now, a group of nuclear physicists drafted a document called the Frank Re- Report and over 150 um scientists from the Manhattan Project, the project that birthed this, um, signed it in support where they were saying and urging the American government not to use nuclear power, nuclear bombs in warfare because it would lead directly to an arms race. And they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong because that's what we're living in right now nuclear warfare nuclear arms racing because we dropped those bombs we created that but it wasn't like these were unforeseen circumstances people were vocal about not using these bombs in warfare on japan during the time people were vocal about the potential destruction it could cause people were vocal about how it could change geopolitics forever People were vocal about this. People were not shy about this. It's the government at the time that chose to ignore all those warning signs, which has led us to be living in the hellscape that we're living in today, where everybody, where we somehow became the judge, jury, and executioner on who can and can't have nuclear war power when we are the only ones that used it, who who have ever used it in war. Joe, it's a fucked up world. But yeah. Again, understand, people were not all in agreement. And on top of that, the there were government officials that were calling for Truman to make sure that um, the cities that, if they were going to use those bombs, so that the cities that they were going to bomb had forewarning that they were going to drop a nuclear bomb on them at a specific time. But Truman and the military ignored that. They ignored that ciao let's get into it oh and another thing on that point is they that isn't out of the blue like warning pre-warning the cities that they were gonna bomb was something that they were doing with the firebomb so it wasn't like they weren't doing that at all it wasn't out of the blue it wasn't something random it wasn't something unattainable they just actively chose not to warn these people to get the maximum amount amount of bloodshed and casualties in order to send a message to the world Okay. On August 6, 1945, the bombing of Hiroshima took place. Now, before the bomb was dropped, um, they had scientists from the Manhattan Project explain how the bomb worked in detail. They were going to watch a movie. The projector failed. And they went out in the morning of August 6, 1945 with the bomb. And um, they had no resistance from the Japanese government because there was no warning that they were coming. And they flew in and dropped Little Boy or Fat Boy. Let me see. What's it? So here's the sad part. Here's the sadistic part. Here, here's where the true serial killerness comes in. They come in and drop the bomb at 8.15 a.m. local time in Hiroshima, meaning this is the height of people going to work, going to school, kids, families, everybody's out. Height of traffic. This is rush hour. And they chose that time for that specific reason, number one. Number two, they dropped that bomb directly on top of the hospital in Hiroshima because it instantly wiped out any medical people who could help the victims who sur- somehow survived this, any doctors, 
any medical equipment. They specifically had the bomb dropping point be on top of the hospital. So all of those doctors, all of that knowledge of medicine, all of those people that could potentially help any victims that survived it were wiped out in the first second. And you want to tell me we were forced by the Japanese government? Baby, please. I mean, I'll I'll enter a clip in here. But as you know, it was completely devastating. There's radiation everywhere. I mean, it was like a supersonic shock totally destroyed two thirds of all the buildings in Hiroshima. And on top of that, those building scraps became really dangerous shrapnel. And, um, you know, on top of the radiation that came down. For 43 seconds, the time and barometric triggers started the firing mechanism. A uranium bullet fired down a barrel into a uranium target. Together, they started a nuclear chain reaction. Solid matter began to come apart, releasing untold quantities of energy. After this, when Truman was praising the troops for, um, you know, successfully doing this bomb campaign and bombing Hiroshima, um, he said that Hiroshima was a military base. And that was a bold face lie that they immediately started switching up the story of the truth immediately after this happened Truman got on that radio and made his speech about how this is a glorious day and how amazing today is and said that Hiroshima was a military base when there were 300 people who lived in Hiroshima mind you 140,000 of those people died because of this bomb so think about that proportionally right but only 40,000 people of, of those people were confirmed to be military adjacent. This wasn't a military town. This wasn't like San Diego or Pearl Harbor for that matter. This wasn't tactical. This was purely emotion based. This is purely about killing the civilians in order to pressure the Japanese government. This wasn't about blowing up um, helicopters and fleets of ships in order to, you know, reduce the enemy supply in terms of tactical strategy type of stuff. This was purely about the shock factor. They waited till 8 a.m. in order to get the maximum amount of innocent lives. They dropped that bomb right on top of a hospital in order to wipe out any possibility of people being able to help the people that are able to even survive such a blast. Right. And then on top of that, they Truman goes on the radio and says it was all a military base. Nigga, please like be serious. So once the bomb was dropped between, I mean, obviously this is estimation, 70,000 and 100,000 people died instantly. And then the rest of the tens of thousands of people that were affected by that bomb who survived it died over the course of weeks and years and months after the initial bombing. Now, a really sad part is that as soon as the bomb finished, um, you know, it, it exploded. There was fires going out, you know, people were thirsty, people were badly injured, people were burned up, um, and it starts to rain, but it starts to rain black. And people are excited that it's raining because of the fires that need to be put out, and people are really thirsty, people are really injured, they need the water. But what they don't realize as they're drinking this water and they're praising this water for being here to, you know, take out all the, the, the burning in the buildings and all of that. The water was radi radiation. 
so these people are drinking straight up cancerous chemicals not realizing it because of course a bomb like this has never been used or created and used on human beings so they're drinking this black rain directly after this bombing so excited not realizing they're completely poisoning their bodies on top of everything on top of the trauma they lost their family they lost their house they lost everything and also you get cancer at the end of it like please be serious it's sick so three days later on august 9th 1945 is when the united states dropped the bomb on nagasaki um what i said before and touched on before and we'll get into right now is that is the exact same day that the soviet union declared war on japan i say this to say back to my point about how the japanese government very clearly made it clear that they didn't really care or prioritize civilian lives being lost because of how they acted after the fire bombings and how that didn't cause them to surrender the american government thinking that bombing and killing this many people would cause cause um the japanese um, government to fall to their knees and surrender um just isn't accurate in terms of what they've shown us for years in this war so many more people died in those fire bombings yet they didn't surrender so to think that okay we're going to continue to kill innocent people with nuclear bombs and that'll get them to surrender when it never got them to surrender in, in the past when more people died i just don't think that that's what it was i personally think it's the fact that on that day august 9th 1945 the soviet union said hey we're also with in war with you and that was one of the deepest fears and dreads of the japanese government now what a lot of people also don't know is that the japanese government reached out after hiroshima to the soviet union and kind of tried to feel them out and tried to ask them if they could mediate a a truce between J the J japan and the united states and kind of be in the middle of the talks of all that and have a neutral ground on that but Stalin took that conversation as, oh, I need to speed up my invasion of Japan. So that's why he decided to de declare war on the 9th instead of waiting longer, which was his intention to. Now, the original um, conditions for surrender, I think it's called the Potsdam. Uh, I don't know, the Potsdam um, conditions for surrender. It was a proposal for surrender between the United States and um, the Japanese government that was before the bombing of Hiroshima now after the bombing it, it was already floated to the table a long time before the bombing of Hiroshima the Japanese government didn't want it now and they also weren't considering it an option um, after Hiroshima what they wanted it, they only considered it an option after the United the Soviet Union declared war on them the same day that they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki so again in my opinion it's looking like the soviet union had much more pull to end the war because of the japanese fear of what a um soviet union controlled japan would look like so i don't think it was the nuclear bombs that's just that's just me speaking child that's just me speaking so the same exact same bombing crew was used in order to drop the bomb on nagasaki but the difference was the actual bomb itself the first bomb of hiroshima was a uranium bomb this was a plutonium bomb so again on top of the sadistic nature of how why and all of that that the united states decided to go this route and what they ignored and the possibility that all of this could have been avoided they were actively using the japanese people and the japanese civilians as guinea pigs to see what these different types of bombs could do ciao so this one's name was um fat man and they dropped it on nagasaki around 11 a.m a little bit later in the morning again similar to hiroshima nagasaki had around 300 residents but even less of a proportion of those residents were even affiliated with the military so that same oh it was a military base again couldn't fly because so little of the proportion of that um, population of people were even associated with the Japanese military in the first place so about 20,000 to 75,000 people died instantly from the bombing of Nagasaki um, the way that Nagasaki is I think it's between um, not between but kind of nestled in a bowl of um, mountains um, it was able to contain the um, explosion a lot better than in Hiroshima so less people died but um, 
even less military people died. Only 50 people of those 75,000 people were military affiliated in the first place. On top of that, in both of these bombings, I forgot to add, in both of these bombings, America killed um, all of the prisoners of war from all over Europe and American prisoners of war that were housed in these places. So, um, but then at the same time, um, Truman got on the radio talking about Nagasaki and said he did this in order to um, help save the prisoners of war that Japanese that the Japanese took when he killed them by allowing them to bomb Nagasaki. So it's like, what are you even again spinning the tail? And also the prisoner of war conversation. They didn't know that the, the that many prisoners of war were killed in those um, bombings until the 1980s when those documents were released. Child. Also, uh, 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 specifically about Nagasaki being the bombing site, Nagasaki was the second choice for the second bomb. The original place was Kakura, Kakura, I think. And be- because there had been some sort of conventional bombing done by the United States on Kakura, um the day before there's too much smoke and they didn't have good visibility so they chose before running out of fuel to fly to nagasaki and drop the bomb there so the people of nagasaki weren't even going to be involved in it at all it's because the americans bombed the original place already that they needed to go to nagasaki in the first place so on august 15th 1945 the japanese government surrendered to the united states again i don't think it was because of the bombs i think it's because they were actively fighting with the soviet union that that being said, the war with the Soviet Union continued into September, but uh, the goal of the Soviet Union was try to get a, trying to get a foothold in Japan in order to be able to lay claim to some of the land and some of the money and some of, you know, involved in their governments and imperialism, as we know. Um, but the official papers for the surrender weren't signed until September with the United States um, in general. Um, again, like I said, Japan knew that if the Soviet Union won the war um, in Japan, they couldn't have their monarchy at all. But with the United States, they could at least have a shadow. Uh, 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 um, they could at least keep appearances with the emperor still remaining in power and he did he remained in power but he was basically doing the direct bidding of the united states government we know how we like to prop up these puppet dictators and stuff a similar thing um but he was there to kind of legitimize the american version of their government instead uh, to keep the people at ease uh, because they were very devoted to the emperor a lot of people don't understand that they were very devoted to the emperor um this was shocking that he ended up surrendering and it, it was it was a a great embarrassment um but basically the emperor stayed in power he became kind of a puppet for the united states government and um their governmental control and yeah they also after the use this is such a white shit like doing something so evil but then immediately making a rule or law that nobody else can do it basically america drops these two bombs and then gets together with all the allies post world war ii and they sign this treaty that says they won't do this it would be considered war crimes and the only what they add in is a clause to uh, discussing the destruction of the bombs in like nagasaki and the fact that these people were mostly civilians they basically sign a treaty with all the allies that say we we won't do this but they of course add a little clause in that um that says unless these places are connected to the military and because of that they were able to forego being put on trial for war crimes for literally bombing these places with innocent civilians because they were able to do that then they made the rule that no one else could do that then they put a clause into that rule that allowed everybody because everyone fucking you know if I uses that loophole to that rule they added that clause in that rule so they can pat themselves on the back and say see we didn't commit war crimes because like we told you they were connected to the military when they actually really proportionally were not which begs the question who decides the rules of engagement and who who gets punished more under those rules and why um I think we all know the answer but you get what I'm getting at you know you do something so heinous, so evil, killing hun- uh, hun- over 100, 200,000 people 
with two days of bombing using an experimental new type of bomb on these places that were mostly civilian and you knew that the first bomb you specifically bombed over a hospital specifically waited till 8 a.m with a height of commute time in order to get the maximum amount of casualties when on top of that you didn't have to drop these bombs at all in the first fucking place you could have had a diplomatic situation with japan um in the first fucking place but you chose the bigger batter option for the notoriety now that being said 80 percent of americans totally supported the bombing of hiroshima and nagasaki totally thought that it was integral in the winning of the war or whatever winning means when in actuality most of those damn people in 1945 were being fed propaganda from the cartoons the news from everything you know hell fucking truman was on that radio speech talking about hiroshima was a military base when it definitely was not so their opinion in terms of the amount of people that supported the bombing child does it matter because these people weren't giving the truth they weren't getting the facts of the situation they weren't knowing that you know uh this was a long con this was a long plan as soon as truman got news that that bomb in new mexico worked he was like get the bomb as close to japan as possible we're using this sucker and then in his diary he's like i will never use it against women and children he 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 like what the fuck can we just like what the fuck and in all of that over 200,000 people died um two major places major cities were completely destroyed and Japan had to completely rebuild after that people got sick i mean the effects the trauma long-standing generational trauma that people like to skirt past and just say we needed to to win the war but then when you research it and you see the many times the american government should have could have chosen the diplomatic route the many other choices that could have been made in instead of going gung-ho for the biggest most explosive most bloody bloody um way to end the war and then to realize that that it may not have even ended the war in the first place because really what the Japanese people were shook about was the USSR joining and declaring war against them, which happened the same day they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. And it just so happens that six days after that, Japan declares its surrender. Bitch, please be serious. So, again so many feelings about this um i wanted to do this video since last year last year for asian american um pacific islander heritage month i did um agent orange i talked about agent orange and this year i i wanted to do this one this year because it's just i mean it's a huge topic i mean they're about to do a whole movie about the guy who created the nuclear bomb i forgot his name but there it's coming out in may or whatever um so i thought it was timely even though i couldn't have predicted that a year ago i just liked the topic and wanted to talk about it in this way on this channel because i feel like nobody talks about the truth of it and this is the truth people coming straight from my from my mouth um again happy asian american and pacific islander heritage month um shouts out to y'all love y'all um next um into uh, next week i'm doing a doc talk on the fog of war which is the clip that i put in about the japanese fire bombing so get excited for that that movie is absolutely i mean hands down one of my favorite documentaries one of the most important documentaries in my life so i'm not being dramatic so stay tuned for that i hope you love that um and then um the week after that we are going to be doing um another true crime in society episode where we're going to be talking about the my Lai massacre in vietnam that's i mean huge trigger warning for that child because it's it's sickening um but we're going to be talking about that um and then we're going to do a youtube tips for a lazy bitch to round out the month of may and then we'll move on to june where we'll be discussing um the aids epidemic probably for two true crime episodes so that being said um Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting. If you haven't already, go watch my previous video on Kayla Barfield's case and go help that family get justice. Do what you can to at least interact with that video. Comment on it. Like it. Something to get it. The algorithmic juju to get it in front of as many people as possible. And call those numbers. And if you can, donate to their GoFundMe. Um, 
I love you guys. Um, I hope you like this video. All of the things. I hope you have a great rest of your day, life, week, whatever. Um, and without further ado, oh, follow my socials. Like and subscribe. You would better watch my ads. For the new people, I hope you liked it. For the old people, love y'all. You, you are the realist. And um, yeah, that being said, Black Lives Matter and Free Palestine Until It's Backwards. Love you.